Stick with me as we learn all about medicinal mushrooms. I caught up with John Michelotti at the Porcupine Freedom Festival held in Lancaster, New Hampshire. John taught a class on how to grow and how to wildcraft medicinal mushrooms. John was nice enough to let me record it and share it with you guys. Now this was a live presentation so there is some background noise a little bit here and there. But I did manage to get the class in its entirety. I'll also have a few shorter videos coming out about growing actual different kinds of mushrooms. My name is John Michelotti. I'm um, the president of the Mid-Hudson Mycological Association as well as a business owner of a company called Catskill Fungi where I make health extractions from mushrooms that I grow on my family farm or wild craft in the woods. And uh, I also lead mushroom walks. I take people in the woods, teach them about what's growing, what's edible, what's poisonous, but really more to inspire around mushrooms and, and, and really um, get people excited about the wow factor in mushrooms because there's a lot of different ways in which we can pair with mushrooms that can be beneficial to um, humans and society and everything. So um, today we're going to talk about medicinals, which is a lot of fun because there's really a lot out there. And I think I'm going to start with you know, giving you kind of the easy, like, easiest ways to get healthy from mushrooms and then work our ways towards, you know, like, extracting from mushrooms that you find in the woods and then getting to, you know, further extraction processes and then um, kind of breaking down with, like, current cutting research. I'll also probably touch on current research around medicinal mushrooms today and um, yeah so easy take home tip any mushrooms you buy in the store you know your agaricus your button mushrooms um, your portobello mushrooms and praminis they're all the same mushroom they're all agaricus by sporus but um, either one of those or the shiitakes you buy the farmers market if you take those mushrooms and you leave them in the sun with the gills facing up, then they actually hyperaccumulate vitamin D, like to the factor of like a thousand. So they might have like 460 international units of vitamin D, and then they'll boost to like 46,000 international units if they're in the sun for anywhere between like two to six hours. So over the winter time, it's like a really great way to get um, D2, you know, just leave them on your windowsill, and it's, it's a great way to stay healthy. Um, mushrooms are great for you. Um, there's a lot of like stuff out there, you know, that, oh, if you're, if you have high candida, if you have yeast problems, you shouldn't, you know, eat mushrooms. And quite honestly, that's not true. And like even a lot of, um, it's, it's just not been looked at, you know, just a hundred years ago, we were looking at mushrooms and they were classified as lesser plants. So, I mean, like really there's, there's more we have to learn about these. Um, so they also are as complete a protein as meat. They have nearly all the amino acids, they're high in polysaccharides, and it's really important that if you want to get these nutrients that you cook your mushrooms. You gotta heat them up to, um, to kind of break down the cell walls of the mushrooms, which are made up of chitin which uh, is the same things that like lobster shells are made out of and, and mollusk shells. And in order to release those health benefits, you have to, you have to heat the mushrooms up in order for those um, compounds and enzymes to be released. So, what's that? Will drying them do the same thing? No, even if you dry them, you wanna, you're gonna wanna rehydrate and cook them after that, yeah. Um, good question, I'm, uh, yeah, if you guys have questions, just like pop them out as we go. Totally fine having an open discussion. I'd rather, you know, be presenting the material you guys actually want to hear than just like. <laughs> so yeah. When you, when you touch on psychedelic. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover that a little bit later as we as we go through and in, in kind of like succession. So. 
Yeah, you, you've got your mushrooms. Anybody, raise your hand if you like wild craft mushrooms. You go out in the woods, you find mushrooms, and eat them. Three people, four people. Really? Five? Okay. Um, we're going to go on a mushroom walk later this week then. Um, I'm, I'm up at Campsite 22 in Agora Valley, right up, right up the hill. I'll have a big Catskill fungi sign, so come see me, sign up for a walk, and we'll go out in the woods and you can try it out. Um, not to say that we're going to find anything, but at least you get, you know, an understanding around it. Um, so yeah, you, there's, and, and if you're interested in it and you can't make it today, go look up your local mycological association and go on a walk with them because it's a lot of fun. It's great, like, to be able to walk out in the woods and come back with 20 pounds full of healthy medicinal mushrooms. So, um, yeah, so, you found some mushrooms. All right. Anybody know what this is? Raise your hand. Yeah, this is chaga. Anybody heard of chaga? Okay, so, no? Guys, this is primo. <laughs> All right, so chaga grows on birch trees. It's, uh, it's a gnarl. This is not a mushroom, per se. This is a fungus. This is like a conch that is caused by a fungus, um, Inonotus obliquius, that is a parasitizing the birch tree. Now, the beauty about this is, is it's, hyperaccumulating betulin from the birch tree it's, and a lot of nutrients. So in Poland and Russia, they've been utilizing this for hundreds of years um, for everything from like digestion issues. Um, the Conti people like over 800 years ago were using it for digestion issues, um, detox, anything kind of skin, psoriasis and it can be made into a salve, or they found that ingesting it is just as healthy. And, uh, and it's one of the, it's the second highest antioxidant known to man, second to cacao. So um, really great stuff. This grows in your woods around here. It doesn't grow everywhere in the world, but it's, it's like a pretty hot topic right now. Um, and it kind of brings me to the next point is like, one thing you should always be cautious of if you're doing any mushroom hunting or collecting is over harvesting. And, you know, you should always have a respect for the fungi and you should have a respect for the wilderness. And, you know, if you find something like this, only take what you need. So you find it and you cut it maybe an inch away from the tree so you're not infecting um, the, the, you're not opening the tree to any further infection. And, uh, and we'll talk about what you do with it. Yeah. Do you make a distinction uh, if you're talking about just medicinal use or uh, nutritional use? Like, you know, just good to eat and it tastes good and you, you know, you fill your belly with it too. Yeah. Or, you know, like with that. Well, I, sure. What you said it sounds like it has a lot of medicinal use. It's going to have a lot of good eats. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Um, John, so, yes. Can you repeat the question for the camera? So, here's your. Sure. He asked me what my shoe size was. <laughs> um, yes, he's wondering what the, you know, the distinction between medicinal mushrooms in eating and, and medicinal mushrooms in kind of tincturing and uh, medicine. Is that kind yeah, of like rough? Is that roughly to make medicine out of, or can you just eat it you know, to fill your belly oh. too? So you're not going to eat it to fill your belly, but this has been utilized in, um, in Poland and Russia. It's kind of one of these things that they keep in their medicine cabinet year round. And um, a lot of people where I live, you know, they find it and they just put it in a pot of water and it sits on their, you know, on their stove and you just keep filling it with water and you drink tea. And it's like this chaga tea is like really great to like keep your immune system up and you know, helps to, you know, fortify your liver, and it's a modulator. But, yeah, this would definitely be kind of more on the realm of medicinal mushrooms, right? Uh, as far as edible mushrooms, most mushrooms have, you know, protein content of anywhere between 10 and 30% um, dry weight, which is, you know, pretty, pretty substantial. Um, thiamine, niacin... And yeah, a variety of different vitamins. I think it's the only non yeah, I'm not gonna quote that. Um, but yeah, it, they have a variety of different benefits. Um, in order to get those benefits, you should cook them. 
The ones that you wildcraft in the woods, some have more benefits than others. Shiitakes are excellent for you, um, and they're probably your second most accessible mushroom that you're going to find out there. Um, there's a variety of different ways to cook them. It's all delicious. Um, I have some dried shiitakes and oysters for sale as well. If you guys want to come stop by, say hi, talk more about that. Um, does that answer your question for the most part? Yeah, I have <clears throat> I was wondering if you could make that distinction like with all the different things you're talking about. You know, this is just for medicine for, and or food. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I uh, It reminds me, it's, it's, it's interesting because the line between medicine and food for me doesn't I don't really see much there anymore because, like, you know, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. It's, it's kind of like you know, everything you're taking into your body is, is, should be medicine for you. You know, should be, you know, something of benefit. You know, that's from like air to food to anything. So, um, yeah, it's just really the knowledge of being aware, really, um, of what you are taking in. So, certain things have more properties than others, and, and certain preparations help to utilize those properties more than others. So, yeah, with this, you're not gonna cut this on a plate and eat it. Like nobody's, it's too hard. It's it's woody, but making a tea out of it's great for you. And what's even better than that is making a tincture out of it. So oh, I also have dried chaga for sale. But from there, you can make a tea, and the tea is great, and it'll last for a long time. And you can just keep it in a pot, and it it, it kind of has a woody flavor that tastes like vanilla and earthy. It's it's actually quite tasty. Um, whereas reishi is a little bit more astringent, you can uh, you can make tea from it. It's a little bit more astringent, but with chaga, the other thing you can do, um, and this is with a lot of medicinal mushrooms, is you grind it up and you soak it in alcohol for like six weeks, higher proof alcohol for kind of denser mushrooms, and this kind of extracts different types of properties than you would from heating it. Um, with water or with oil or something like that. And, you know, just for example, the black in this chaga, you can tell the inside's very kind of like uh, corky, and the outside's like quite black. The black in the chaga um, is what's hyper-focusing that betulin in that birch tree, which your body doesn't know how to absorb, but by doing an alcohol extraction, it changes that betulin to betulinic acid, which your body can absorb. And that betulinic acid is one of the main immune boosting properties of the chocolate. So I make these health extractions. I do a triple extraction. If you guys are interested in like making your own medicine with mushrooms, like jot it down. I also have flyers and you know feel free to come up and grab one if you want. Just check out the bottles and stuff. But um, I do a cold water. I do an alcohol extraction for six weeks. Strain it. I do a cold water extraction, which, which gets enzymes for about 24 to 48 hours, strain it again, and then I do a triple decoction where I put it in a pot with hot water, and at 175, never above 180, reduce it down so that it concentrates, do like a triple reduction. So you start out with three times as much water, reduce it down, and then you add your three liquids together, and that's a concentrated tincture. That you're making. Actually, that would be considered an extract. A tincture would just be an alcoholic like process. The extract is all uh, more than one. Is there alcohol in the final product? Yeah, there is, yes. And that's what helps to preserve it. And like this is a way you can make your own medicine with plants. It's different with plants because you know they're made up of the cell walls are different. Um, mushrooms, it's a little bit harder to break down, it takes a little bit longer, but um, are there any medicinal mushrooms for Someone mentioned that. Yes, yeah. It would depend on what the cause of the migraines or headaches would be. Whether it would be like inflammation or, um, yeah, it could be a variety of different things that are causing the headaches. But, um, yeah, I've had a lot of people have a lot of luck with reishi with that generally. Because uh, reishi, that's this. Anybody seen this? Oh, you have. Oh, thank God. Um, this grows on hemlock trees around here, guys. This is like known as the, the mushroom of immortality in China. Wow, what a name. Um, it's 
it's been studied for about 2,200 years and is, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, people in China and Japan use this as an ornamental. So reishi in, in Japan is what it's referred to. Ling chi in China, it's also known as the lacquered polypore um, around here, but it grows on hemlocks in the northeast, grows on maples, other hardwoods out west. Um, but this is a very, this is the most highly cultivated mushroom for medicinal properties. And for good reason. This is kind of like your silver bullet. It's, it's kind of really encompasses the most. If I could only do one medicinal mushroom, this would be it. And, you know, Chinese medicine, they, they tend to blend a lot of herbs together. They like to say, you know, like we're going to combine a lot of things and it's going to help for certain things. They say if you could only take one thing, it would be this. And that's because it's, it, it modulates. So it modulates your immune system. So if you have an overactive immune system, you get allergies. It brings that immune system down. It actually can help with seasonal allergies, pet allergies, things like that. If you have an underactive immune system, it brings you up. Same thing with cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar. Balances. People report like much even keel. So I do like four farmers markets a week. And it, it's great. It's great exposure because I have a lot of people that, you know, I'm seeing on a regular basis. And they take tinctures on a regular basis. They come up to me and they, you know, I always want to know how they're doing, how they're feeling with it. So it's, it's great, you know, if somebody comes up, oh, I have an overactive thyroid, like what, you know, what, what can be helpful? And I say, I don't know, you're, you're fucked. But no, but like, I just, but I don't actually say that. No, but I, I, you know, I work with people. I always say, you know, I, I can't treat or diagnose, like talk to your doctor. This is what I recommend. I can provide you with scientific studies and like you should provide your doctor with that and like hopefully he's cool enough that like he can figure out that it's not all about you know isolating all sorts of chemicals to give you so um, I've had people yeah with high blood pressure my doctor says I need to be on blood pressure medication what am I gonna do I don't want to go on medication I said, all right well I've done some research here this says lowers blood pressure I've had people come back and say my doctor says I don't have to be on it this is great you know, and that's like one from Big Farm. Thank you. So, um, these have a variety of different health benefits that are, are just kind of fantastic. From liver to lungs to heart. Um, it's also like great neurological benefits. Helps with insomnia, um, nerves, stress. It's, it's really kind of like an overall cure-all. So, um, so, I'm going to move from that. Check my time. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where we are with research. Yeah, hey. Uh, do they have, are there some of those that grow on trees that are not okay to eat? Or, or do you see one like that? Or they all like that? Yeah, that's really interesting you say that. You know, if you know what you're looking for and you can identify it to species, then you're in good shape. But, like, you know, I've had people mistaken mushrooms, so I can't just tell you, yeah. You know, like I, I've had people see this and see something else and say, oh, that's that. And I'm like, well, actually not. So hemlock trees around here has that lacquered look, very reddish. It can also kind of take on a little bit of a different coloration. This is one I grew on my family farm from a sawdust block. Um, and it's the same mushroom. So um, really the only way to be sure is to identify it to species. Now there's a variety of resources you have. You can get a field guide. My favorite is the Audubon's Guide to North American Mushrooms, um, written by Gary Linkoff. The, but you can post on mushroomobserver.org. You see a mushroom in the woods. You think it's cool. What is this? You take a picture. Post it with a description on mushroomobserver.org. And within two hours, somebody, some mycologist will have gotten on there and named it. And then you can go and see their profile and see how many correct things they've named, things like that. It's a great resource for mushroom hunting. No apps on the phone that I know thus far that are actually functional. If anybody knows, let me know. Um, so, let's see. So, as far as, yeah, as far as like finding them though, they're certainly out there. And, um, I, you know, people can always, Send me pictures. Email me a picture. 
ask me if you know this is what it is. So, um, but hemlocks, you're in a good bet, and you can also look up your local mycological association, and they're usually very helpful for that. Um, so, I'd be wary of Facebook. <laughs> Some people on Facebook just spit out answers. Um, yeah, so the other one I'm going to talk about is growing in this bag. And it's called Lion's Mane. And lion, is, lion's Mane? I'm not even going to ask if anyone's heard of it. Okay, so Lion's Mane, it's, it's really kind of a hot topic right now because the research that's coming out around it is that it's the only thing known to man that can regenerate the myelin sheaths of your nerves. So it can actually regenerate nerves. Like right now, with nerve degenerating diseases like MS, dementia, we only know how to slow down, you know, degradation. Now, we actually are looking at how you can rebuild, which is, it's pretty groundbreaking stuff. So, um, so you can't patent a plant. You can't patent a mushroom. There's not really a lot of, uh, there's not really a lot of funding in, you know, studying these things in Western science. All the, most of what we know about medicinal mushrooms is from the East. It's from China, Japan, Russia, and not the United States. There's a major reason, there's three major reasons why, you know, a lot of, Western scientists don't regard Eastern science as valid. And those three are, one, they don't test for placebo. So that's like a major thing. Placebo is like nearly 40%. I mean, it's really high. They don't do double-blind studies, which is also pretty important. And thirdly, they don't isolate variables like you know, Western science does. Like, we basically would break down this to, like, 160 different, you know, polysaccharides in here. We just try to get one. And we try to see how that one affects one disease. And, like, they're taking a more overall approach of saying, we're going to use this whole thing to see what happens. So it's, it's less specific, which... Um, which I'm not necessarily sure I agree with. I busted my ankle like a month or two ago. I went in, they, it was like a major sprain, and they gave me this boot, right? I don't know, if it, has anybody like been in one of these boots before, right? Okay, so it's kind of got a curved bottom. And when you stand on it, you're like this. Just hanging out like this. And like your, your ankle's immobilized, and that's great. Your ankle's doing just fine at healing. In the meantime, this knee starts to hurt, this ankle starts to hurt, your hips are off, your back's hurt, and now your, your neck is cranked. So as far as like isolating variables, they got that, but the rest of me is, you know, so it's, it's just interesting how we are perceiving studying these things, but, um, but that's okay. I mean, I feel like, you know, both sciences are valid, and it's, it's important to know both sides of the story. Um, and then really just kind of come up with your own conclusion. And it's pretty much what I recommend for people. It's like, you know, see how you feel. You know, do, do what you think is, feels good for you. So, yeah, so that's, that's these are like, these, these are like the rock stars of the, might of the mushroom world when it comes to medicinal extracts and tinctures. And now you know how to make them. And now you know how to find them in the woods and where where to identify them. So, oh, we're doing good on time. So, why don't we go out for the crowd for a second? How are you guys feeling? It's hot. I just spit a lot out. Huh? that question again. Let's uh, just <laughs> All right, all right, all right. All right. That's, that's question two on that subject. Can I just find those in the woods? Yes. You can find them in the woods. You can find them outside courthouses. You can find them in a variety. You can find them on sandy beaches. You can find them on six out of seven continents of the world. You can find them all over the place and not just poop. And um, there are probably nearly... 
60 to 100 mushrooms out there that um, have medicinal, magic medicinal properties. So, yeah. The deeper blue they stain, the more psilocybin they have in them. That's like the rule. So, um, yeah, there's over 104 million different types of mushrooms, though. So, you know, 60 to 70 isn't like that many, but um, they are common. And they're more common in urban areas and suburban areas, actually, than they are out in the country. Um, this is because the way spores travel and float and land, it's, it's you know, they're actually quite common uh, where, they're, where they're found. Okay, good question. So, mushrooms, I don't have an example. So, mushrooms, um, when you think of your normal, like, um, kind of fruiting body, mushroom, the stem, the cap, um, when you scratch the surface or you pinch the cap, um, over time, they might stain a different color, like the, the color changes a little bit. So that staining um, is one of the key identifying characteristics of figuring out what mushroom it is. There's a lot of different characteristics on finding out what mushrooms it is. Um, I actually don't have a talk on that this week, but maybe if we go on a mushroom walk, we can talk more about that. Um, so. Yeah, so with, with the psilocybins, the more you'll, you'll scratch it, and the deeper blue they bruise, um, the more psilocybin is within the mushroom. How long does it take to bruise? Uh, each mushroom's different. Some are instant, some take a little bit of time, like an hour or more. So it's, it's really different. But um, And some don't bruise at all. But, um, yeah, medicinal mushrooms. So, yeah, the... The properties of the properties of psilocybin mushrooms are are now being studied a lot more than they were in the past. In the past decade, I should say, they were studied before. They were considered a Schedule One. Am I saying that right? Schedule One drug, which means. Um, that's by definition to have no medicinal properties whatsoever. So it's it's pretty difficult to do any kind of testing. Johns Hopkins, NYU, a um, few other schools are doing some studies with um, with psilocybin mushrooms in controlled environments. Um, previous studies in the past were done with like in chapels with multiple people, half them were on mushrooms, half of them weren't, there was preachers, there was like, I mean, it was just out of control studies. And this is why it was like canned for a long time. But now you have like a single patient in a room in like, you know, a dully lit room with couches and flowers and it's just like super wusa. And like, you know, they have like, sometimes are blindfolded and one out of four people are are uh, reporting the most spiritually potent experience of their lives. Um, so, you know, we look at a lot of drugs out there as like, oh, it's an upper, it's a downer, it's like a hallucinogen, it's like a depressant. Like, yeah, some medicinal mushrooms, ayahuasca, um, and, and some other drugs have been utilized for thousands of years by ancient cultures. Um, and they're entheogens. Entheogen is something that is chemically interacting with your body and inducing a, a heightened spiritual, spiritual sense of awareness. So, you know, this is how we're kind of approaching medicinal, I keep calling them medicinal mushrooms, because they are. Not only are one fourth of people reporting the most spiritually potent experience of their lives, but they're overcoming chronic addiction. They're overcoming, um, they're, they're feeling much, much better after, you know, in a hospice situation. So, 
They're also trying it with post-traumatic stress syndrome. People are really kind of they're finding new levels, and now that now the studies are happening with depression, and it's not like you have to keep taking the drug over and over. It's like you have an experience which moves you beyond being held back by that thing. So I think over the next like couple of years, you're going to see more research published around that. And hopefully, you know, it'll move around in the in the legal aspects of things and become a little bit more available to people, but highly doubtful because, you know, pharmaceutical companies make money when you have to keep coming back. So, um, but as far as, like, I'm not, like, advocating having that experience, I'm, I'm but, like, if that's what you choose to do, you're going to be in a safe environment with people you trust with nothing else to do and in a good headspace. But, um, yeah, so this is, this is kind of like, did that, did that kind of like cover the subject pretty well? You know, like feel people, people feel pretty good about that one. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's certainly a lot out there. Um, yeah, before I move further, yeah. Uh, so, uh, mushrooms and salads taste good, but really not, nutritionally not that um, productive, I guess. Not too productive. Might be helpful for like detoxing the liver, if you're eating them raw. Uh, and the other question, um, is there a simple way to know the poisonous mushrooms so you don't think that? Yeah. There's no like one rule of thumb. That's the thing. I guess, I guess I don't even like that expression, but um, I guess the one thing you can do, you got to identify it to species. Now, there's that being said, um, you know, there's some deadly poisonous mushrooms out there, but you can eat any mushroom once, so like, feel, feel good about that, um, but you should always know what you're eating. Like, they're old mushroom hunters and they're bold mushroom hunters, but there are no old bold mushrooms. So like you have you have a variety of resources at your disposal. Um, within the first like year or two of mushroom hunting, if you like want to go out and like really, you know, I, I was always somebody that like I just like to go out in the woods and find food, and no plants and hunt and like, you know, grow my own food as much as I can. And uh, I, I just realized I didn't know anything about mushrooms, so I went on a mushroom walk. And really, within the first two years, in our area, there was like six safe mushrooms that you can very easily ID and know that like, okay, the poisonous look-alike, when I cut it in half, is black, and when I, the edible is when I cut it in half, it's white. I mean, it's that black and white. It's like that. What six are those? What six are those? You have puffballs. That was the one I was just referring to. Where, I mean, they grow on lawns, you know, big volley balls. Um, they also grow on wood, those little kind of pear-shaped puffballs. You cut them in half, it's white inside. Those, those are the same ones where you step on, they release those green spores. Well, when you get them young, they, uh, they're white inside. Not much flavor, but they're pretty good. Chicken in the woods, probably the first mushroom I ever ate. Anybody, anybody eat chicken in the woods? Yeah, right? Okay, so Chicken of the Woods is like the color of that shirt there. It's like bright yellow, it's orange on top, and it grows 20 pounds at a time. I mean, it's, it's on dead trees, and there's really nothing else out there that looks like it. And when you get it young, it's, it's great. My, my four-year-old nephew is running around here somewhere. He's nine now. Um, he... He identified it at, at four once I showed it to him once. I mean, it's it's like, it's a really easy one to ID. Just as long as it's not growing on conifers, it can be okay. You know, that being said, like, anybody could be allergic to anything. So it's always good to try a little bit of the mushroom, save the rest in a paper bag, and, you know, see if you have an allergic reaction to it. If not, you know, enjoy. Hen of the Woods. Hen of the Woods. It grows on um, oak trees. 
It's fall. It's coming up early September, and it grows big fronds. It's, it looks it's gorgeous and uh, incredibly good for you. Maitake. This is like one of the main things they're looking at with, um, with different cancer. You know, mushrooms can reduce the size of cancerous tumor because uh, they, they are, uh, the way it works is they, they kind of boost up the blood cells that target tumor cells. So your, your cells have self-destruct mechanisms that um, if they're sick, they self-destruct and they get flushed out of your body. New cells get created. Um, tumor cells shut off the self-destruct mechanism, which means the cells just kind of keep growing and glom and, and are sick. And this maitake, reishi, each one for different cancers targets those cells and it causes apoptosis. Apoptosis is that programmed cell death. And this is how it literally reduces the size of tumors. So, um, so yeah, this is my talking. This is like the one that you're going to learn in the first year of mushroom hunting. Once again, you find like 20 pounds of it when you find it. Delicious, too. It's one of my favorites. Um, let's see. Chanterelles, morels, puffballs, and uh, black, black trumpets. Black trumpets, no poisonous look like. So I know I'm kind of just like spitting out names, but like. If you guys want to come visit my booth at some point, I have books and books and pictures, and y'all can just kind of flip through, and we can talk more about it. Um, yeah. Any other thing about anything? Oh, lion's mane. Yeah. Does that grow on a tree, or is that just yeah. out of the ground? Or? Yes, it grows in a tree. It's mostly associated with the... Uh, Elms, I think, but it really kind of differentiates. But it grows like a bear's head. It's kind of like this white waterfall-looking thing. Also, yeah, if you find it, it doesn't really have poison, poisonous lookalikes. Like I said, I always recommend triple checking. Look it up in a field guide. Contact your local mycological organization and post on mushroomobserver.org. Get three checks. But the beauty about mushroom hunting is it builds on itself. So a lot of these mushrooms pop up in the same areas every year. So, you know, you go out in the woods, you're lucky enough to find like 10 pounds of chickens. Chicken of the woods, I should be more distinct. <laughs> you're not on your neighbor's property. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you, you know, you get really excited, you bring them home, you get some of your idea, you find out what they are, you get excited, you eat them, and they're delicious. You can return there, like kind of year after year. Same time, two two days after a rain, and it really builds on itself. You get you get good at identifying, you get good at you know telling them apart, and you get your your spots that you know you can kind of return to. And uh, yeah, I know a lot of I know a lot of like hunters out in my area. You know, you go out and you sit in the stand all day and you get down. <laughs> We're walking out and like, oh my gosh, there's like, you know. It's a whole like loaf of oyster mushrooms. Like great. Like you're not going home empty empty handed after all. You know, it's it's kinda nice. Um, so oyster mushrooms would be another one. The guild mushrooms. A lot of your like cap stem ones, those are usually like more advanced mushrooms. And you're going to kind of learn to identify and tell the difference before you start eating them. Uh, most of the other ones are are not your normal cap stem mushroom. Let's see. Okay. Thank you. So there's like one last thing I want to touch on. It's a little bit mind blowing, and it's kind of off the subject. But, um, I'm just gonna touch on it, and then like I want to go back to questions and feeling stuff. So there's this guy, Trad Cotter. Right now. This is like this week. So Trad Cotter's down in North Carolina. I was hanging out with him um, last October. I toured his lab and facility, and what he is doing. Is is pretty revolutionary to the medical industry. So right now, like we've got these superbugs out there that are resistant to antibiotics that we have going on, and um, the the forms of testing to get things approved 
go pretty long. So like you got to do in vitro tests, in vivo tests, you got to do, you know, tests on rats, then you have to do tests on, you know, select humans, and those have to go on for a certain amount of years. So like every drug we're creating to stop these viruses and, and, and bacteria, it takes three years between the time we, we start testing the drug between when we can actually start using it at the public. Well, and by that time, you know, the virus and the bacteria could have, you know, we're seeing these things get stronger. And, and, and then our, our drugs aren't working anymore. We need stronger drugs. So what Trad's doing, what he found is that mushrooms compete and they, exe they exude enzymes when they compete with each other. And so he's introducing bacteria to a growing medium like this. And what happens is these water droplets form because the fungi actually fights the bacteria and then ex excretes of them. So he's, he's talking about a new kind of doctor's office, clinical lab that you go into and you have strep. And they take a tongue swab and they put it on a fungi. The fungi adapt and they'll actually learn to attack that certain specific virus that you have, extrude the enzymes, and now you have a throat spray that's specific to your bacteria. So this is like, I don't know how you isolate variables with that, but it's, it is, it's, pretty, it's pretty revolutionary stuff that's coming out right now around mushrooms. And these are just like a few ways that people can pair with mushrooms to really improve their lives. So, um, yeah, that being said, if anybody wants to continue the conversation, I'm at site 22 up the hill. Questions? I got probably like two minutes. Yeah. How do you use tinctures from the skin? Because right now it's like water and drinking. Yeah, they're rectal drops. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, you put them under your tongue, you put them in a drink, you put them in food, you can, um, yeah, just sorry. <laughs> I've always wanted to say it, you know? <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, you can, you can kind of pair them with any kind of thing you want. With the, cha the chunks of chaga, I recommend people make tea and then do an alcohol extraction with that. Happy to give you directions for it. And uh, yeah, each bottle lasts a month. Um, I take reishi and chaga every day. Um, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of people really feel a lot of difference from that. And, uh, and since it's preserved in alcohol, it kind of lasts indefinitely for the most part. But um, yeah, happy to answer more questions about that later. There's a question in the back. It's hard to separate variables. Um, what, there are some other methodologies to Yeah. Repeat that question. Couldn't hear. Sure. Basically, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you were saying, like, what, what do I use personally for validating um, the use of tinctures, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Anecdotal evidence. That's pretty much all I got to go off of. Um, until I get my tinctures made in a approved FDA approved lab, then I can send them to universities. They can do double blind studies, and I can prove that like this lowers blood pressure. Until then, um, yeah, I'm at farmers markets. I have people come up to me and say I have pain. I have arthritis, and I say I I open up my clinical guides. Um, this one's a really good one by Martin Powell. It highlights 19 different mushrooms and talks about, it has like a section of cancer, it has a section of a variety of different ailments, and it links to which mushrooms have been studied and the scientific research that's out there. So like I, I research a lot with clinical guides and things like that, but that's a really good point because there's a lot of BS out there, especially around Chaga. You look at anything on I don't want to name names. You look, there's a lot of websites out there that are are bunk, and it and those are the first ones to pop up. 
and it takes longer to weed through those. But um, this is another great source. This is Fungi Magazine. It's the most read, widely read mycological um, magazine in the country, and they did an issue on Chaga, and it really talks, it peels over everything about it. But really digging through resources, I'm happy to provide them. Um, and I have the books with me up there. We can really peel through things. If you have specific questions on specific, you know, ailments, um, you know, let me know. We can, we can definitely talk more about that. But it's it brings up a really good point because supplements are completely unregulated. So anybody can, you know, pee in a bottle and put, uh, has not been evaluated by FDA and sell it. So... It's really important to know what you're getting and, and do the research and figure it out for yourself, which is, you know, we don't all have time for that, but, um, but it's worth taking the time. Food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food. Um, what, one more? Yes. Please kill that damn bug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's buzzing around my fly. Where? Oh, when? Uh, uh, Wednesday? Right. Leaving with Uh, If you come visit me in my booth, I'll have like a sign up sheet. We'll, we'll go over it. I haven't scouted yet, so. Types you showed us all grow off the trees. Uh, yes. And they're all like the most potent as far as medicinal values to them. Uh, is there a reason for that? Is it because they're drawing something from trees versus from traditional growing in the soil? Good point. Um, sorry, I know I'm going over and over. Is that okay? Yes, there's definitely a difference between mushrooms grown on trees from wood versus what's um, being produced by supplement companies grown on grain. I think I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, <laughs> mushrooms generally grow on trees. That's where they grow from, right? They don't grow from just out of the soil. They're growing from root structure that was there from the trees that would take the atoms and grow. Question. Yeah, they can grow. Uh, they can grow on a variety of different things. Um, just recently, found that there's mushrooms growing along the entire ocean floor that are breaking down like crustacean shells. Um, they actually there's four different functions of fungi. One is parasite. One is a decomposer. That's the one we're used to. There's also mycorrhizal fungi, which are interconnected with the root structures of plants and trees. Ninety percent of plants have interconnected roots with fungi. The fungi help to translocate nutrients to those plants. Um, and then 100% of plants have endophytic fungi that live within the tissues of the plant. That's 100% of plants have fungi living within them. Like every leaf, every stem, every twig, like piece of bark has fungi in it. So, um, yeah, they, they host a variety of different functions and they can host multiple functions where they're helping to keep that tree alive in the function and then the tree dies, it changes its function and now it starts to decompose it. So it's it's really pretty amazing. The fungi that's in every plant, uh, I mean if you grow from seed in a sterile medium, does it is it in the seed basically? Yeah, it's in the seed <coughs> beforehand. And you want it there. Like it's it's definitely helping to help that plant resist drought and um, changing climate, things like that. So it's it's certainly helping the plant live while it's alive, and then after the plant dies, helps to break it down. I mean, there's, these are amazing beings. Amazing. So, um, yeah, I don't want to go too much further. So, thanks, everybody. When you make talks? Oh, yeah, yeah. Two more talks this week. I'm giving one tomorrow. Um, I'm just looking up the time. At 11 a.m., here, and then my sister Kate, Kitty Michelotti's at the Porcupine Central is doing her make a buffer for humans versus zombies at three, and then I'm speaking again on Thursday here at eleven. Um, tomorrow's talk is going to be on fungi for the future, present innovations and projects for doers, thinkers, and dreamers. Thursday's presentation is on mushroom cultivation, grow it yourself, feeding the world. Thanks. Don't
Don't forget, if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to my channel. Also, give this a thumbs up, a like, a share, or if you have something to add, remember to comment below. Thanks. Also, don't forget to stop by terranlupo.com. I have up videos that you can't see anywhere else. Currently, I have one on carnivorous plants and also how to make your own mead. All you have to do is go over and sign up at terranlupo.com and all that's free.